So, Nick, your investigation focuses on what Australian authorities say is a key example of China's influence in the Pacific, and it centres on one man. So let's start with him. Well, this one man, his name is Zhao Fugang, and it's really an extraordinary tale. What we know of Zhao Fugang publicly is that he's very prominent the Chinese Communist Party. So for many years in Fiji, where he's a naturalised citizen, he's been spruiking Chinese Communist Party interests. He's been getting close to senior Fijian uh, politicians and very close to some senior Fijian policing officials and bringing Beijing closer to Suva. What is extraordinary is Australian authorities are now saying, in addition to doing those things, according to them, he's an alleged organised crime boss responsible for, and these are just allegations, and a range of other serious organised crime offences. So consider that. You've got one of China's, the Chinese Communist Party's main, let's call him, influencers, fixers in Fiji, who has been pretty well promoted by the local embassy and also the Chinese Communist Party state newspaper organs, etc. And this same man, Australian authorities say, is one of the most powerful alleged organised crime bosses in the region. He's been listed as one of our highest priority targets in Australia. And is accused, and again, these are just allegations, of causing or posing a grave threat to Australian security. So tell me about that. I mean, you've just said Australian th- authorities suspect Zhao, he again, he denies all the allegations of being an organised crime boss, but what is the impact, allegedly, on us here? What this story tells us is that the West and Australia believe that China is using malign actors and actions to spread its influence in the Pacific. Uh, That's an extremely disturbing revelation. And here we have, for the first time, Australian agencies actually sort of almost formally responding to it. So what I mean by that is by designating Zhao Fugang an APOT, Australian Priority Organisation Target, what that means is the weight of Australian agency power, so the, the power wielded by our federal and state agencies and law enforcement and other security agencies will be brought to bear on Jiao Fu Gang. If that's the game that's being played, the geopolitical game that's being played in the Pacific in terms of Australia and China wrestling for power and influence in the Pacific, it shows us that it's really hotting up, that there are malign actors being brought to bear by, on one hand, Beijing, if you believe the Australian intelligence, but on the other hand, Australia is combating this. It's pushing back and it's choosing to target these CCP entities to see if if we as a nation, our our agencies, can shut them down. So what is it that Australian authorities are so worried that he could do? So what we reveal, essentially, is he's been designated as this priority, high-priority target by Australian law enforcement agencies. Now, in the past, people who've ended up on our, it's effectively our most wanted list, are people like Hells Angels, international bosses. We don't expect to see a Chinese Communist Party-backed businessman in Fiji on this list, but here we are. What are the Australian authorities worried about? Well, number one, they're worried about the allegations that he's this man, Jiao Fu Gang, is involved in facilitating the shipment of huge amounts of narcotics into Australia. But in addition to that, the information about him that I'm aware of also shows that Australia is concerned that he's a tool for Beijing to facilitate its political interests in Fiji. So they're the two uh, concerns that Australia has. And they're responding to, to those concerns uh, you know, very forcefully by this designation of, of Jiao Fu Gang as such a high priority target. And we know Jiao Fu Gang, he has lived in Fiji for a very long time. So what is the Fijian government saying about all of this? We sat down, well, I sat down with the Fijian Prime Minister, the Fijian Home Affairs Minister. The Home Affairs Minister is responsible for the defence and security of Fiji. Uh, he revealed that Australia had approached him and shared intelligence about Jiao Fu Gang. He wouldn't say precisely what that was, simply said there was very serious concerns placed on the table. He also stressed it was just foreign intelligence and that Fiji's authorities would need to actually look into that to draw their own conclusions about its its accuracy or otherwise. The Fijian Prime Minister, though, was very forceful about his concerns around China's behaviour in the region. He said he did not not like what he saw when it came to China's, for instance, presence in the Solomon Islands, where they know... We, we know that Beijing has struck a, a security deal that's caused a lot of consternation in Canberra and in Washington. 
the Prime Minister Rambuka said that he wished that China might peacefully extract itself from places like the, Sor the Solomons to ensure a more traditional uh, security deal setting was, was uh, back in place across the Pacific. He also raised what I think is a stunning suspicion from a, a serving Prime Minister. I asked him, would you call on the help of the Chinese authorities, the Chinese state, to help you fight this major organised crime and drug trafficking problem on your doorstep in Fiji and, and nearby? And he said he was worried about doing so because he wasn't sure if China was in some way supporting those organised crime actors involved in the drug trade. Mm. Uh, that's a, a very serious suspicion, just a su suspicion, but very serious to make about Beijing from a, a Prime Minister. Uh, what does this all mean? Ultimately, Sidavani Rambuka, the Prime Minister, said, I prefer to do business with Australia and New Zealand. I know what they stand for. Uh, their systems of justice and politics are closer to ours. Uh, and for the time being, while I'm, I'm, I'm continuing dialogue with, with China... Uh, I'm more comfortable aligning with the West. But you had a fascinating experience because while you did sit with Prime Minister Rabuka and he expressed the concern, you know, that he, of course, uh, protects his nation's sovereignty and his sort of suspicions about China, you then also spoke with Fiji's Home Affairs Minister who had a different take. So can you tell us about that? Well, it was quite interesting. 24 hours after I interviewed the Prime Minister, I interviewed the Home Affairs Minister, and he said... In contrast, the Prime Minister, that a very controversial memorandum of understanding, uh, basically a security deal between Beijing and Suva, was back on. It had been suspended, uh, put on ice by the Prime Minister Rambuka when he was elected in late uh, 2022 because of concerns about the Chinese policing approach to things like civil liberties. So to have the Home Affairs Minister suddenly say, no, this is re-enlivened, it's back on the table, we're, we're back in business with the Chinese police uh, and security agencies was, was surprising. What does it say? I think it tells us that Fiji is stuck in a difficult place. On the one hand, it has China pushing it strongly to accept uh, aid, financial support, security support. On the other hand, it has Australia doing the very same thing. And it's a poor country. It needs resources. It needs training. It needs expertise to do things like, like fight the drug trafficking that's such a concern. And it's got its hands open to any outside force that can help it do that with, of course, some qualifications on, on that sort of support. So th this is a danger, though. If Fiji doesn't pick a side, if it plays both sides, suddenly we have an escalation of tensions in the region. And Prime Minister Rambuka said just that. You know, while on the one hand they want to do business perhaps more with Australia, they'll keep doing it with, with China, yet central to his concerns was all these offers of, in his words, goodies from other countries puts Fiji in a situation, a position where it risks its sovereignty, its security, its, its own standing being bought by the highest bidder. And that's something the Prime Minister wants to avoid. So, Nick, many of our intelligence agencies are concerned about China's attempts to influence Fiji and that this might actually evolve into a security threat to us here. But as you've written, Chinese influence in Fiji may also erode democracy there in Fiji. And we saw that with a frightening incident that involved Chinese detectives in 2017. So can you tell us what happened then? This Chinese police operation, I think, is a really important case study of why democracies are concerned with China's desire to supplant the West as a policing partner for countries like Fiji. What we saw in this operation was a whole, I think, uh, several hundred Chinese officials, public security policing officials, flying to countries like Fiji, swooping on Chinese nationals. Now, the Chinese government accused these Chinese nationals of being involved in cyber scams. And sure, that may have been the case, but the traditional way and the way that our legal system tends to and, and, and Commonwealth legal systems tend to deal with these uh, issues uh, is there's an extradition process. Mm. Those in a foreign country have legal rights. They can contest their extradition. What happened in this case is, is these Chinese police flew into Fiji. They swooped on these Chinese nationals. They loaded them onto a plane and flew them back into China's legal system, which we know is a black hole when it comes to, to rights. Mm. There was no proper interaction with Fiji's legal system to preserve the civil liberties of those that were arrested in Fiji. And that's caused a great deal of concern uh, amongst human rights 
activists, civil libertarians, and amongst Fiji's elite. It's one of the reasons why Prime Minister Van Booker is concerned about policing partnerships with China. And so is this the sort of incident that Australian agencies are concerned about? I mean, especially with regards to Fiji reenacting a security agreement with China that you alluded to before. Absolutely. The style of policing how our Pacific Island neighbours conduct themselves. We, we, we want to promote democracy. We want to promote rule of law. That's integral to Australia's role as a, as a democratic middle power. China has its own way of doing things. And this is where there is a conflict. And as China seeks to push out the West, expanding its own influence, Australia is concerned for a range of reasons, but one of those core reasons is, is about those values that, that we do stand for. Uh, and we don't want to see police forces in our Pacific Island nations treading on their own people's civil liberties. What happens in those situations where well, we have countries that threaten to turn into totalitarian states themselves? And we've seen that in, in Fiji. We, we've seen a military coup after military coup. It's now a, d a democracy, some would say, uh, at least a, a partly thriving democracy. That's a, that's a situation we want to see replicated in our region and, and that which, which uh, must be protected. And we know that this is part of a broader tussle, I guess, between Australia and China in the region. Some listeners would probably remember that the Australian was arguably caught asleep at the wheel a couple of years ago when a draft security agreement between China and the Solomon Islands was leaked, which appeared to sort of grant the Chinese Navy, I guess, a safe harbour. So how does this play into this, I guess, larger tussle? Well, ultimately, going back to the man we, we started talking about, Jiao Fu Gang, he again is a great case study because what we know is that Australia and its agencies have now fired up to target him and to investigate him. And that's indicative of a broader ramping up of the way Australia is dealing with our Pacific Island neighbours. We're offering far more development aid, security aid, policing support and diplomacy. And this is all about reasserting Australia and the United States, our, our closest ally in the region, and pushing China or trying to contain China's own desires to rise w within the Pacific region. Uh, so it's a significant uh, tussle. Yes, we were asleep at the wheel in places like Fiji. Uh, there were sanctions in Fiji. We did not want to deal with Fiji after the military coup in 2006, which brought to power the former Prime Minister, Bani Marama. Who walked into that vacuum? Beijing. And Australia was too slow, many experts say, to come back to places like Fiji and to say, we can offer you support to hopefully become a thriving democracy and we'll do so not only because it's in our interests, your interest to do so, but it's, it's in the region's interest and Australia's interests to do so. And one of the experts you spoke to said that even if Zhao Fugang is not convicted of any crimes, that just the fact that the spotlight has been put on him will actually make a huge impact in terms of lessening whatever influence he might have in the region or perhaps even serve a warning to, to people who might want to have an influence in the way that he has allegedly had. Does that give you any hope, I guess? Well, then ultimately, it wasn't too long ago that Jafu Gang you know, was attending security conferences with the Fiji police commissioner and other senior Fijian officials. An extraordinary thing. I think this reporting will lead to lots of questions about what he's been up to and his relationship with the Chinese state and will render his ability to influence Fijian elites, politicians and security officials on behalf of Beijing, uh, it will render that, uh, well, he's going to be far less effective. This is a, a tussle that will continue f for years. And you know, we've not even spoken about some of the m most significant developments uh, that aren't actually happening in our immediate region, but Think of the U.S. election. If Trump is is re is, is re-elected, becomes president, that will have a significant impact on the way that our region deals with these sorts of of threats, and the way that China deals with our region. And of course, much of this is about China's relationship with the U.S. and the U.S. relationship with China, and that could be subject to considerable change depending on what happens in the U.S. election. So there's much at play here. Uh, it's a hotbed of activity our, our region, and so it should be. And the good news is Australia is far more engaged than it was six, five years ago, uh, but so is Beijing, and that battle continues. Well, thank you so much, Nick, for your time. My pleasure.